Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. It's Leppy Duels, episode 25, still presented by Jarvi Media. And yes, I am still your host, Jacob Arvidsson. Thanks to all you guys at home for helping us reach the quarter century mark. We appreciate all you guys very much. And it's because of you that this show is still rolling. So thank you for watching. We're shaking things up for episode 25 to keep things fun and to celebrate the milestone. So three guests will be joining us this week. We'll uh, talk about the difference in format here momentarily, but first let's meet the cast. First up, he's the winningest player in Lepi Duels history, the brand manager at Great Lakes Disc, Brian Papa Wolf Raleigh. Next up, he joining us for the first time a couple weeks ago live in Illinois is Dick Engelman. And finally rounding out the cast this week, he's a member of Leprechaun Hollows and he's supporting the non-playoff Red Sox, Ryan Kenny. Thanks for joining us, all three of you guys this week. Everybody at home, here's how the format will work. Everything else will be similar to the previous episodes that you've seen of the show, however, all three contestants will be taking on three of the questions this week in a three-way challenge, um, in addition to the normal head-to-head -head duels that we usually do. So we'll have six questions still. One contestant might end up going over three wins. We'll see if that happens for the first time. But first up, Kenny, you'll be taking us on to, uh, to lead us off. Dick, you'll be second. Brian, you'll be third. The question is based on the Stat Mando rankings that were released last week, where for the first time since January of 2012, Paul McBeth and Ricky Wysocki are nowhere to be found in the top three after a decade of dominance. So the question is, will we ever see a decade-long duel like McBeth and Wysocki had in the top three again? Kenny? Yeah, great question, Jake. Uh, you know, 10 years of just a, a dominance, one and two back and forth, you know, I don't know. I can't think of another sport that had a 10-year run of a peer number one. Everyone's going to say there's a goat here or there, and a, you know, an, an arguable mental fact. But when it comes to disc golf, this this, this sport is, is young in its mature age. And I feel with the last three or four years, just the population and the talent and the attention that it's been getting – it's going to be really, really hard for any number one or number two to continue to go back and forth like Bird and Magic used to. Um, so my answer, long and short at the same time, no way are we going to see another 10-year run. All right. Well said. Dick, you've got uh, next up here. I do want to say I appreciate what Paul and Ricky did over the last decade with all the world championships and all the majors that they've won. But – that's over with for the most part. They'll still get their wins, but going forward, it's going to be another group of young gentlemen who are going to have some duels back and forth. Um, there are a few names that I could say, and I don't know which two or three might be the ones going after it, but you got your Gannon Burrs, you got your Isaac Robinson, just won his first Worlds. You have Kyle Klein, he's still super young. A bunch of other guys. Anthony Barella can still be in that conversation if he learns how to play on Sunday. There will be two guys who end up really dominating the sport in the next 10 years. I don't know who, but those names I just told you are a good few candidates to be those guys. Okay, so definitely a different take than, uh, than Kenny had. Brian, where are you going with this first question? I think whenever you give uh, infinite as an option or not infinite as an option, I'm going to take infinite. So in this case, yeah, I'm going to argue that it will happen again. Why? Because it's happened in our sports history previous to this. Uh, we look at uh, the time frame from when Paige won her first world title to the time where Katrina won her last world title. That was 10 years. They battled. They were definitely one and two the entire time there. Um, we look back into history and we see Ken Climo dominated for eight world championships in a row there, Mr. Kenny. So it has happened uh, where people have great runs uh, and the people that stopped him uh, battle each other like Schultz and Fieldberg, Feldberg as well. Um, will we see this in the future? Yes, it's just a statistical improbability. Now, if you put the odd time frame of 10 years on it, uh, yeah, I think we will see it within the next 10 years. Our sport is getting better athletes, and more athletes are attracted to this sport. We're going to see top-tier battles with top-tier people. We might not even have met them yet. 
Okay, Kenny, you got a chance to hear the other two. Uh, go ahead and respond to them and defend your point a little bit. Uh, great points, Richard. I love the names that you, you threw out there. Uh, to, the, to Mr. Frawley's point, though, uh, KC winning those eight in a row, there was, what, a total of 6,000 players? How many of those are professional? We've got 279,000 MA2 numbers. Uh, not MA2 numbers, I'm sorry, just PDGA numbers. Uh, statistical <laughs> improbability, absolutely. It ain't going to repeat 10 years and twice. I would be surprised if we see a three-year stretch. All right, Dick. The cream rises to the top. And I don't care how many number of players there are out there. Sure, the competition is going to be harder. But in almost every sport, the cream always rises because there are that many more people playing. And so if you look at any sport, there's dominant players throughout history for all of them, especially in disc golf and ball golf. But then there's always that person who that competes right next to them, their competition. That's what drives the best players to keep going and getting better and stronger. So that there will be somebody, and whoever that cream is, they're going to rise to the top. All right, Brian, bring it home. Why do you uh, deserve to win duel number one? I deserve to win duel number one because I'll use both their points to win. Uh, so here, <laughs> is, minutes, here is Dick's miss. Dick didn't name any names. Kenny did name names, but he missed them when he named them. So Dick should have used examples like <laughs> Nadal and Federer uh, along with that. That would have been a great. Uh, and then Kenny used the bird magic thing, which isn't a good enough analogy when he let off with uh, uh, Michael Jordan in his first time around saying that he was the that, GOAT. That got cut. That guy didn't make the, didn't make the take. <laughs> That's why I win. <laughs> well said, Brian. I like I like that you uh, I like that you took some shots at them and and responded to their comments versus just doubling down on your own. Um, I think that gives you a slight edge here because all your points were good. So Brian's gonna take the first duel or the three way duel, I guess. Second uh, duel of the night will just be a two way between Ryan and Dick. Uh, Kenny, you're gonna be up first here. Mm -hmm. Change one thing about disc golf culture, if you could. This was probably one of my favorite questions I've seen come across. And this one holds true to me. And that would be the stigma. That would be the stigma that comes across a disc golfer or a disc golf culture. And what I mean by that is someone who works in the, the corporate Americas, my favorite thing to do is to talk about what I do in my free time, and that being competitively disc golfing. Now, when you say that in a corporate board meeting, people look at you and like, what does that mean? You just go out in the woods and get all twisted on dope and drinking an alcohol all day long. So my, you know, it's, I want to change the culture of it. And I think that's coming from what we're seeing today with the younger generation, the, the attention that it's coming with, the fact that it, it is more of an athletic sport, in my opinion, than pickleball. I would love to see the stigma for disc golf get erased, get wiped out. As with any other sport, golf, bowling, cleaning, whatever you want to do, you can be your own person. But the disc golf culture is starting them young, teaching them how to respect nature, be sustainable, and have a good time to be an honest person. So I think the stigma is what I would like to change. Okay, good answer there. Kenny, Dick, what are you changing about disc golf culture? You're right that there is a stigma. However, it's unfair. We're doing the exact same thing as ball golfers do, softball players do, all sorts of other sports like that. You think ball golfers aren't going out, having their drinks, smoking their dope, you know, having a great time, yelling, whatever else, out in the woods? We're doing the same thing. But I want to focus on the animosity between tournament directors and players, and it goes both ways. Tournament directors are always getting called out for bad layouts or payouts, uh, the players pack, you know, getting accused of making a bit of money when they spend tens, hundreds of hours to get that tournament set up. On the other side of thing, tournament directors have animosity towards the players for all the little things that they're always complaining about, whether it's the, uh, you know, the out of bound lines and the, whatever else they have to come together and realize that it's all going to work out and we're all going to be fine. And this sport is still growing and it's going to be great. So you both bring up two great changes, two different changes, but two great changes to the culture. Um, go ahead and respond to your opponent's comment, but also 
Uh, kind of give a solution to your change and, and how that would be implemented, Kenny. Uh, Dick, great points. Uh, I know as a uh, league board member, it is a action that is sometimes unnoticed. So uh, shout out to all the TDs out there. I know I'm debating a couple of them right now. Um, I think the the stigma just, it, it goes away with, continuing with do what's doing what's right you know we've got uh, we've got local pros around here doing uh clinics uh for the young uh definitely getting them younger um out more i like the fact that churches are building more more courses i think that's uh you know at least showing the public that hey look we are a, a public family friendly type sport uh continue with the tournaments again just with everything else that dick said if you're a softball player or a golfer, you're going to do what you want. Again, I think we're just raising the sport in the right the right direction it needs to be so far. All right, Dick, bring it home. Yeah, I don't think that uh, we do have the best reputation, first of all. But when I see online, and to my point, I'll, we call them the keyboard warriors, you know, they, they think they know everything. And they will say things online that they would not say straight to your face as a tournament director. Some will, and those are the ones that all the tournament directors are talking to each other about those guys and or ladies and like, oh, they're going to be at our tournament. And there's that animosity from the TDs to the players too. We need to come together and stop your bitching and just play some disc golf and have a good time. All right, well said from both of you guys. Again, great changes that you guys offered up to disc golf culture. Um, I'm going to get nitpicky here on Kenny. I think you uh, you gave some props to Dick for, for how he responded to your own comment um, and your own change. So for that reason, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lean toward Dick on this one to, uh, to break the stalemate. So Dick takes the win in duel number two. Duel number three is another um, three-way duo here, or three-way duel. Um, Dick's going to be up first. Brian's got second. Kenny will round us out. Isaac Robinson, obviously your new world champion, he gets a, uh, a world's release um, custom disc from, from Prodigy for his, for his championship. He chose the A2, they chose the A2, but I want to know from your guys' perspective, would you have gone that route choosing the A2, or would you have gone um, with a different mold from Prodigy, Dick? Uh, one word with that choice, and it's boring. Why would they take one of their most popular discs and then just recreate it and put a stamp on it? They have such a big opportunity to make a new disc. Think about a Malta or an Athena or any of those, the Zeus. All those discs are brand new and they were created by the player. I want something that Isaac Robinson went into the lab with their scientists, if you will, and say, hey, this is what I needed to do. They try something, go out, throw it again, throw it again. No, change it up, be more of a stable. Whatever it happens to be, it's his disc that he got to create. And I think as a world champion, you have that right to create something that everybody out there gets to throw. And also, it's going to make you better and give you a better chance of being another world champion. Well said. Brian, what's your take here? Listen, from the sales perspective, uh, an A2 is a fine disc. Like, everybody can use an approach disc. Like, it's, it's an easy sale disc, but it's not a home run. It's a, it's a bloop double in the late August. You know, it's nothing special. Um, this is uh, an opportunity to uh, help your brand, help your brand both personally as a player and then the bigger brand of Prodigy in the market. We know that they could... Uh, have some positive endings to the year because they started off the year in, in a negative outlook. Um, and I would have went with the F9. The F9 is one of their newer molds. It's extremely popular. Um, it's an easy to throw, beginner friendly fairway driver that anyone can throw. Even Richard can use it with a backhand and at least get 230. Um, so anyone can try it. Um, and that is a better way to introduce a new consumer, a person that is uh, trying to buy more Frisbees. Uh, no one's going to drop their zone to go grab an A2. So come on, man. All right, Kenny, bring this one home for, uh, for the first initial statements. Look at what MVP did when Conrad won. You guys call it boring. You call a putt approach boring. That envy brought them from two printing machines 
to 11 printing machines in three months. Okay, they sold more discs in 2021, maybe, maybe beforehand, doubt it, probably afterwards, because they put a repable disc out there that everyone wanted to throw. They sold more discs that year than they did in all 11 years combined. Take the PA2, take the PA3, or uh, the P2 or the, the, the PA3, make it sales, from a sales perspective, you're gonna get your, your money, you're gonna get more followers. I will say introducing a new disc would be a smart idea, but not on this release. Take the wave and ride it. Take the money right now. All right, so several, I would say three different takes for the most part here. Dick, you get to respond to them first. All right, Ryan, the James Conrad disc was the greatest shot in the history of disc golf. That's the reason that it got so much play. It wasn't because he was a world champion and used that as a putter. Nobody is saying that Isaac Robinson won worlds because of his A2. It's just one of the discs in his bag. He uses it very well, sure, but to come out with something totally new and totally fresh would really just set that whole thing open for him to show that he can be one of the top tier pros that there are. Okay, Brian, you've got a second rebuttal here. If Prodigy didn't already have a mold in the works prior to this, you're minimally eight weeks out and you miss a lot of that frame uh, to, to hit the uh, iron while it's hot. And uh, Prodigy needs to hit every iron they possibly can. That's why going with a disc like the F9 that's approachable from all angles is really good. And then the problem with the James Conrad putter thing is he threw an Envy, but then he made a Nomad. They're two different things. And it actually split their sales. Uh, and ask a lot of those basement dweller retailers how many Envies and Nomads they still have in their basement after that happened. So I don't think that was the best plan. Easy to use fairway. People are less likely to drop a putter, more likely to add a new fairway. Okay. Kenny, bring it home. They took some shots at you there. Yeah, great point. Uh, to Dick and Brian, both your points, you can't drop a new disc and you can't drop an F9 because they're not in his bag. You go back to his April 23 version of In the Bag, Isaac Robinson runs through. He's got two P2s, two PA2s, and then two PA3s, and he throws them both and you can watch him through the entire world's round he bends corners with it no one out here is going to throw a 440 like you said or you can sit throw the, the f9 at 230 but i i still think you're going to get a better business decision taking the pa3 or the p2 pa2 okay so kenny's saying go strictly to the putting putters dick's saying make a full mold new mold brian is saying let's go with the f9 nobody's defending the a2 decision um, which is interesting. I thought one of you might take that route, but regardless, here we are. So this one's tough. This one's up in the air. I thought, uh, Dick, I think I would like to side with your point because I think it sounds the most reasonable. However, like Brian pointed out, you would have to have that already in the works or this is going to get kicked too far down the road in production um, before it gets released and it's not going to have as much hype around it. So for that reason, I think I am going to lead toward... Kenny on this one. Um, the putter the putter is an interesting take versus the F9, but I think the key point that you made was what is in Isaac's bag, and uh, that one drove it home. So Kenny takes the win here. We're all tied up. One win apiece. I mean, I'll take sympathy points all day, baby. That's a, that's a layup. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're all tied up. One win apiece. Uh, Brian versus Dick here in duel number four. Brian, you're up first. Uh, you guys are talking about sudden death playoffs after the Canadian Open or the <laughs> whatever it was called, this Mania Open up in Canada, sorry, this past weekend with Eagle and Isaac. Um, do sudden death playoffs need a minimum number of holes in the playoff loop, Brian? Uh, it should 100% be tournament director's discretion. Uh, we need to empower our TDs to be able to make these rules that fits the course the best, uh, fits the uh, level of sanctioning the best, and fits the tier of player the best. Those are three things you have to take into consideration. One of the things that I drew inspiration from is looking at our uh, beloved PGA rules and how they decide different events. For many events, it is a minimum three holes, meaning 
it's three holes they have to play and then they will take an aggregate score for something like the u.s man u.s open they have to play the entire 18 hole course again the following day if there is a tie and wouldn't that be good uh if we could change one of the pdga rules to allow us to move on to monday and yes there's travel and all these things we are in a baby infinite stage of the sport i get it blah 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 which moves back to the point, let the tournament director pick what's best for that course. Maybe a one-hole playoff is great for your MA3 on the weekend. Maybe a four-hole aggregate is great for your pro state championship. All right, Dick? Well, I think you just said one of your points is we're, we are still in the stages where there is the travel situation. They need to get to the next course the next weekend to get there and practice. We need to get this done on Sunday night. And I say we start from hole one and go from there. Most courses end on 18, obviously, and hole one will be pretty close to where hole 18. And so I'm thinking about the fans and how they can get there. I look back at when James Conrad hit his shot against Paul McBeth at Worlds. How long did it take for them to even get all the fans and everybody up there? They had to walk back a couple holes to the signature island hole and they let one hole decide the whole thing. Just start from one. It's uniform. You don't have tournament discretion. It's about the rules as you have them. Okay, Brian, respond to Dick and uh, defend your own point. Yes, it is about the rules, but as the question stated, it's challenging the rule. Should we challenge the rule? Yes, we should challenge the rule. We need to make it course specific. We need to make it more entertaining. Like we don't need a, a five hole playoff, uh, you know, in MA2, but we might need a couple hole aggregate for a pro level event. I think it's a shame. We might have gotten robbed of great golf. Uh, we don't even know. But if you worry about the travel thing, this is the type of stuff that's announced ahead of time. It is written into rules. It is written into bylaws of the event. People will know that maybe our majors are allowed to have one extra day of competition if there's a tie. Think about how much attention that would draw to it. Okay, Dick, bring it home. Can you win the duel? If you're looking for attention... How do you think there are going to be fans there on a Monday? They all got to work. They got to go to their jobs. It's up to the tournament director discretion. Just lets anybody do whatever they want. You got Nate Heinhold doing one thing. You got whoever else doing another thing. And it just becomes a crapshoot. You don't even know probably going in the <laughs> tournament what happens if there's a playoff. It has to be listed. <laughs> but why does it have to be different? All right, so this one's up in the air. Um, you guys are all over the place on this one. Um, but I do like where both of you are leaning. I think Dick responded well to Brian's point there in the rebuttal as far as, you know, excitement-wise, maybe for the fans at home, the Monday playoff in a, in a major is, is going to bring some excitement. But at the same time, the fans on the ground aren't going to show up and there's not going to be any... Um, any on the ground hype. So I think I like that rebuttal from you, Dick, and I think that gives you the edge here. Congratulations, you picked up your second win of the episode. Sends us to the Thank next you. duel. Ryan Kenny versus Brian Frawley. Kenny, you're up first. I pass. Are this golf course <laughs> just forfeit? Profitable. Just forfeit. He's mad now. Take it away. Let's go. Are they profitable? Uh, they can be. Should they be? No. Could they be? Yes. Are there some out there that are? Absolutely. Are those a lot of fun to play? You bet. Um, I look at it this way, much like you would a, a golf ball course. Um, do I want strollers and bicycles rolling around while I'm trying to throw my upshot or tee off on the, on the, on the tee box or hit a birdie? No, absolutely not. So I pay money and I go to these spots and I'm paying for someone to maintain the park. I'm paying for the expectation of a fantastic course. Now, if I want to go to a public prop, public course, you know, and, and have to deal with those things, I don't anticipate to pay for it. And that is part of a public park. Therefore, you deal with what's going to happen. However, if I'm going to pay Bill five bucks up at Flip City, I know he's going to take care of that property. And I'm probably going to give him a little bit more than five bucks because that is a fantastic course, well-maintained, well-kept. So uh, are they profitable? They could be. Should they be? Depends on what you want to play. All right, Brian. 
Yeah, so disc golf courses are profitable, but not in the way that we're thinking. Disc golf pro courses are profitable because they raise property values around, they bring quality of life around, they bring uh, health and fitness to your community, which lowers the amount of obesity and all those wonderful things. And we could argue all those points. But when it comes to simple finances of a, let's use a private course uh, in this perspective, are they profitable if you charge the right price? if you find the right amount of land, and if you have the highest rated quality product. There are top 100 rated courses on UDISC right now that have a great way of doing this, where there might be a couple people uh, that live on the property and they all have other jobs. Uh, and then anything that comes from the property is just kind of bonus or goes to pay for upkeep. But if you wanted to start right now, a brand new disc golf course by private land, start to go, you're looking at minimally close to a half a million dollar investment in the great state of Michigan between land, a 20 by 30 building, property taxes, and things like that. It would take a lot to make that profitable quickly. Okay, so we got mixed answers from both of you. Use your rebuttals to uh, kind of hammer home your point here, Kenny. Brian, I think you talked beyond what we already have out there. So you're answering a question that we're not out there yet. We're not asking, is it is it a course that we can turn into a property? If we look at a public one, if we look at a normal one now, uh, I feel, again, private courses, like the ones we get to play around here in West Michigan, I don't, I don't doubt any of it that those courses are well-maintained, well-kept. Ones we pay for, we know where the money's going to. Is it profitable? Maybe it pays for an extra pizza at the end of the week. I don't know. Public courses, again, are they losing money? We don't know. Our taxes go to it. So I think they, they can be. Should they be? It's up to the, of, of the course. All right, Brian. Like I said, uh, public courses bring a lot of uh, property value increases, uh, health increases, all of those easy things to hit. But if we look at uh, courses and are they profitable financially, uh, look at great success stories in the Ken uh, Metro, Metro Park area with Kensington and Hudson Mills and things like that. They are taking a small portion of a already larger product, charging special access to that and creating enough money to cover their expenses to mow it and maintain it. All right, so I was hoping for a yes or a no. We got neither from either one of you. I didn't like any of your answers. Nobody gets a That's point. A better question, Nobody gets a point. We're going to the next. Point. We're going to the next duel. Uh, Dick, you are leading us off. Brian, you're going to be second. Kenny, you are going to be third. Who needs a strong performance at the MVP Open this weekend to end the season? Who needs it most, Dick? I'm going to start on the female side, and I'm going to go with Juliana Corver. I love her. She's one of my favorite pro women of all time, and she is just inside the cut line going into this weekend. Um, she got fourth place in Portman Open with all the best players playing there, and this course is wooded just like that is. So I think she's going to do well out there playing accurately. On the men's side, I got – Uli, and he is just outside the cut line. He is currently, I think, in 34th place. Um, his best finish, though, was fourth place at Adelwald, and he shot super well there. Again, all the best players were there, and he came out in fourth place. And again, this course is a wooded course. It's not just throw it super far on a ball golf course. He has to navigate those woods and do well, but he's going to do well, I think. Okay. Brian? I'm going to go a different route here and not name a person. I'm going to name a product, and I'm going to name a company. Specifically, what we want to see or what I think we need to see uh, and what we hope to see is Discraft do well. Uh, it's been a couple weeks, and uh, outside of Missy in, in, in uh, early August there in Illinois, we haven't seen enough of the names up top with Paige out, with Paul out for the rest of the year now. Uh, we would love to see uh, some more success. 
they are the best selling product in my store in the store I work for. Uh, and it's easy to see when Discraft isn't doing as well. Uh, if you go to all of their uh, team Discraft pages, there's there's a couple uh, people that still got lots of tour series fundraiser discs left. Uh, so it would be great to see someone like Holland pop off or Corey Ellis pop off uh, and be able to uh, sell those Frisbees both from the store and from their personal store so they, they can make some more money. Great take there, Brian. Kenny, bring us home. Yeah, well, three-headed monster here. I'm going to go a completely different route than both those. Uh, one individual, simply because I wanted to see a little bit more of him this year, and I don't think uh, I don't think he delivered uh, as much as, as we had a whole all hope, and that's Kyle Klein. I you know I had a lot of aspiration of coming off last year's dubs and his strong performance. He he hasn't quite quite crossed the finish line to where I was expecting, or I think he was, he was hoping to live up to. So again, not a shot against him, but I, I, I feel he could, he has some redemption to throw out there. All right. Three different takes. You know, I love that Dick, uh, go ahead and respond to the other two and tell us why your uh, picks of Juliana and Yuli are the people to watch this weekend. I'm going to start with Kenny's point there. Kyle Klein, I looked at the list of points all year. I think he's like seventh place so far this season, so I don't think he's doing that bad. But I'm going to go back to Uli. Um, he, we're going to the sales of the disc and everything that Brian was talking about, how Discraft needs a win. Yeah, guess who can do that for him? If Uli goes out there, he needs to be the captain. He needs to sell those discs. You know, he, I looked it up earlier, he averages being 45th place in all the tournaments that he played this year on the Pro Tour. 45th place as the captain of Discraft. Do better or else your legacy might not turn out so great. All right. Strong words from Dick. Brian? Listen, that's not why Yuli was brought in to be the team captain. Uh, his legacy is already cemented. Uh, but, yeah, it's always great when his stuff can sell because they put his name on probably the fourth or fifth most product behind uh, the other Paul, Paige, uh, Missy, and Brody. That being said, though, holy cow, Ryan Kenny. I've never heard such a wrong statement. Kyle Klein finished top six nine <laughs> times already this year, won once, uh, and had a four- or five-week injury streak uh, as well in there. So uh, he went up this year in his UDIS rating and his Stat Mando rating so, and his PDGA rating. So I'm just perplexed by that statement. Uh, but thank you for that, and have a blessed rest of your day. <laughs> yeah. All right, Thanks Kenny, you get, to, you get to finish this out here after uh, they took some shots at you. Hey, I'm happy to be here. Uh, I just hope everybody had a good time tonight. So, uh, you know what? If, uh, if you need to throw punches, I'll take them. Don't worry. No, um, Mr. Probably always coming up with the stats. Dick, always going to argue with you. Jacob, thanks for having me. Uh, you wanted a hot take, I gave you one. So You're not even going to defend anymore? I still think he could have done better. Look, I mean, look at his missed putts that you just can see he was defeated. Like, I, I don't know. I think he expected more out of himself, too. So, but then again, he's probably one of the more local players I, I follow just as close. So, yeah, that's why I, I was a little bit more invested in that answer. All right, Kenny, I do love the answer. I think your expectations and maybe Kyle's expectations fell a little bit short. But regardless, I think it's hard to argue that Kyle isn't having a solid season overall, uh, especially with the one Pro Tour win. So, can't give you the win here. Um, Dick, I thought you maybe uh, sucked up to Brian's point a little bit too much after he went outside the box to answer the question. Brian's going to win this duel. That puts us at a tie for the episode. Brian and Dick sends us to a tiebreaker duel. Your uh, tiebreaker question is the coolest annual limited disc drop of each year. I guess that's uh, kind of intuitive from the annual part. But what, uh, what's your answer, Brian, you've got first? I would say the most sought-after one over uh, the last handful of years was obviously the Sexton Firebirds. That's like the biggest. Uh, that's that's the thing that people go after. It's not the coolest though, uh, and I have to admit it's not a Discraft disc either, because there'll be a new annual release, and it's coming here in the next ten days, and it's from MVP, and it is a Simon line, and there has not been a buzz around disc golf from a collector and seller and buyer standpoint around a disc um, 
like this uh, in a long time. Uh, you know, it's almost killed the 20 year buzz hype. Like literally we went from everyone seeing the great Ledgestone release of 20, of 20 year buzzes to the bar stamp 20 year buzz release and then the Cicada and people got excited. Um, but it's going to be when Simon releases a disc every year from now on. That's going to be the annual uh, thing. As he adds to his line, as he adds to his molds each year, that will be the one that people go after the most. He's got the best personality for it. All right, Dick, what, uh, what's your choice here? He already gave me my choice. It's the Sexton Firebird. Every single year, it is the most sought after, the coolest looking got a great logo on it and there's a reason it is the most expensive disc out there on average i'm sure the sign line will be cool but it will not come close to the sales that the sexton firebird will get every single february it's the firebird until it's dethroned it's gonna be the firebird all right, so we've got the Sexton Firebird versus whatever disc Simon is dropping annually in the Simon line. Brian, you're up first we don't to even respond. Know. Uh, it is still definitely Simon. Uh, there was 2022s on our shelves for way too long at the store. If you look at things like the Mindbender that is dropped every every year from Simon, or if you looked at um, his uh, special Doombirds that were dropped once a year, those things sold out faster over the last three or four years than the Sexton Firebirds. It's the new wave of COVID and on players. Simon is a much bigger name. They followed him from one brand to another, and he is a more important name to our sport. That's why the MSRP of these new Simon line discs is 50, and the MSRP of a Firebird is 29.99. Math there, Richard. Dick, Dick, he's taking shots at you. Can you win the episode? Simon couldn't even carry the most disc sold at Discmania. That was the Cloud Breaker by Eagle. He then goes to a much smaller company. Sure, they're going to sell a lot of discs for him, but with Innova behind him, that Firebird is going to be straight fire, and it's going to sell more. I'd put a dollar on it. Firebird. Yep. Dick's betting a dollar, Brian. I hope you take him up on that because uh, I think the Simon line is going to beat it out. However, the question was, what is the coolest annual limited disc drop every year? I think you both answered it fine, but I, I'm going to lean to the Simon line. I was just fluffing the answer there. Brian wins the episode. You Congratulations. What, the what do you got for us? <laughs> Richard, we do know what the disc is going to be. I held it in my hand today. It's very obvious what the disc is going to be. It's got a name and everything. Thank you. Uh, more importantly, though, uh, thanks for the win. Every I've got to give uh, Kenny a big shout out for coming on here and bringing the comedy this week. Uh, Jacob, thanks for the three way. It's always fun to have that. But uh, I want to give a shout out to two people who don't disc golf but watch the show every week, and it's my neighbors. So, What's up, Ryan? What's up, Jenna? Uh, they, they live that way, and they watch the show every week. They're Levy Duel's biggest fans, but they have never even disc golfed in the last 20 years. Thank you, Brian. See, they can get that PA3. <laughs> they can get that PA3. <laughs> Isaac Robinson drop, dude. Thanks for that shout-out, Brian. Um, Ryan and Jenna, thanks for watching the show. We appreciate you guys, um, even though you're not uh, disc golfers yourself. So we love to hear that. Thanks for supporting the show. Obviously, Ryan Kenny, Brian Frawley, Dick Engelman, thanks for being a part of this uh, three-way duel episode this week. Everybody at home, enjoy the MVP Open, and we will see you all next week. Thanks for watching.